Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Your Mark on the World show. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe, and our guest today is Dave Ross. He's the president and CEO of the Task Force for Global Health. The organization just won a $2 million prize from the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. Congratulations and welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you very much, Devin. Uh, enjoy being here. Well, we're, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, tell us a little bit of what it's like to accept a $2 million check. Well, you know, I'm really not quite sure what it's like. This is the first time something like this has ever happened to, <laughs> to me or to my organization. Uh, of course, we were thrilled. We were actually quite shocked. Uh, I think most, for the most part, uh, people's organizations are nominated multiple times before they get selected. It's uh, a rare group that, that a club to be a part of. We were just frankly stunned when we, it was announced that uh, we were the winners. Uh, wildly pleased. This is going to help us towards uh, funding our new building, a building we need because we continue to grow for the work we do. That's great. That, that will in, enable and empower you for years to come, I imagine. Uh, let's talk about the work that you do, uh, because that's really the, you know, why you got the prize, uh, not because you were building a great building, but because you were having tremendous impact around the world. You're working to eradicate, uh, among other things, some diseases. Uh, you're part of the effort to eradicate polio. I've talked a lot about that. Uh, people who are fans of the show know that I uh, talk a lot about that. Got my little polio pin here. But uh, tell us about some of the other diseases that you're involved with eradicating. We're, we're involved uh, in a class of diseases that are referred to as neglected tropical diseases. These include blinding trachoma, which is a bacterial infection of the eye um, that's mostly spread by flies and it's associated with bad uh, hygiene and, and uh, poor water conditions, sanitary conditions. Um, we also work to eliminate a disease known as lymphatic filariasis. Uh, the lay community may know it as elephantiasis you may have seen pictures of people with giantly swollen legs. Um, that's one, one of the diseases. We are also working in, uh, to guide a global partnership for the elimination of intestinal worms, uh, technically called soil transmitted helmets, but another parasitic infection. Worms, you've known about visiting a, a you know, developing country and coming back with worms and needing to be treated. Uh, so there are hundreds of millions of children, particularly affected throughout the world, uh, adults also, but, but we're aiming very much towards children for elimination of those, those diseases. So as we look at those three, just, just to focus, give us a sense of the progress you've made and the prognosis for elimination of those diseases. Uh, yeah, and I left, I left an important one out, and that's river blindness, uh, another parasitic disease. Uh, so let's start there. River blindness is a program began in partnership with Merck almost 30 years ago, and we are within, um, well, I would say conservatively 10 years of eliminating that disease, period. Uh, it is an, um, an amazing um, achievement. And it's because Merck made a commitment many years ago. Dr. Roy Vagelis, then CEO of Merck, made the commitment to provide as much drug as needed for as long as needed. And they have kept to that promise. That's a wonderful example of corporate philanthropy. And the Merck Mechtizan Donation Program, as it's known, um, we will achieve elimination of that disease probably no more than 10 years from now. We are closing in on a, a small number of countries uh, with a small number of cases. Ultimately, the challenge becomes post-elimination surveillance. How long, do you have to, how long do you have to watch uh, over an area to know that the disease has not reemerged? So that's, that's one. Blinding trachoma is another, a bacterial infection through a hugely generous donation from Pfizer, 
Corporation uh, donating a drug known as Zithromax. Uh, we are treating several hundred million people a year uh, in, in, in countries where the disease is still endemic. That disease should be eliminated as a public health problem. It'll never disappear off the face of the earth like the case was with smallpox uh, because it's a bacterial infection. But it will be eliminated as a cause of blindness and as an, what we would refer to as a public health problem where it's not really being spread within the population in any significant amount. That will happen within another five to seven years. Um, lymphatic filariasis, it might be as long as 10, but we are getting there. Um, and um, it may be as, as soon as five years. So these are, in intestinal worms, that, that one's going to take a lot longer. It's, it's much more pervasive. But uh, that's happening because of our model of building effective partnerships. So that's that's great. Kind of the summary. Well, you've raised so many issues that, that I want to talk to you about. I hope you have some time. <laughs> but, but Dave, uh, let's, let's talk about surveillance. We saw just this summer uh, really a fairly shocking, I guess I would just say question raised about surveillance. I'd like you to address that. In Nigeria, there had been no reported cases of polio for two full years, and then suddenly three cases popped up. Now. Yep. It, it, the genetic strain of polio that popped up there was the same strain that had been there when they last found cases. In other words, this wasn't an imported strain from Pakistan or Afghanistan where the disease is still endemic. It had been there the whole time in the community. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see that as a surveillance failure? And what does that mean for the eradication of polio specifically? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I see that as a surveillance victory. Um, <laughs> okay. Really? No, you know, think about it. I, I, in the case of, of uh, Nigeria, and actually I was there a month ago, um, and, and I was there when those cases were detected. Um, Yes, it's in the case of polio. It's 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 scary that that those cases reemerged. Eliminate the transmission of wild polio virus that can happen be through uh, non uh, apparent disease excretors. People who have been vaccinated themselves are not uh, with the disease, but able to transmit or excrete wild polio virus. Until we change the type of vaccine that's in use around the world, we will really not eliminate the potential for this kind of thing to happen. So the reason I say it's a victory is that the case of, of Nigeria, uh, their field epidemiology training program has been effective. It has developed a cadre of field epidemiologists capable of working at the local level to do broad communicable disease surveillance. Um, and that's what we have here in the U.S. Every citizen in the U.S., uh, know it or not, is protected by a broad public health uh, network. Your local health department, your state health department provide that kind of protection to you. And it's, it's an almost invisible protection. I think most citizens aren't really aware of it. Uh, it's like having a fire department, but you never see the building. You don't never see a fire truck, so you kind of just take it for granted. Well, in Nigeria, they have uh, built effective disease surveillance. Our uh, TEFINET program, which is a field epidemiology training uh, network, uh, helps support, and this is done through the generous support of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Our TEFINET program has worked with the field epi program in Nigeria to help build their their capacity and their capability to actually work the local level to detect uh, these outbreaks. It is also the reason that surveillance capacity exists in Nigeria that it accounts for why the Ebola outbreak was captured quickly and stopped in Nigeria. Had that not happened, Nigeria is the most populous country in, on the African continent. If Ebola had been allowed to spread there the way it did in Sierra Leone, 
for example, uh, we would have had a truly horrific situation. Uh, it would have been but a it didn't disaster, happen. really, given the, the scale of that country and the population, right? That's right. I mean, it just to contain it in such a large population would have been very difficult. So having local uh, and national disease surveillance uh, capability is really essential. So that actually is another one of the major programmatic emphasis that the Task Force for Global Health has. We work with, I think the number is 88 countries right now, helping them develop their field epidemiology surveillance capacity. Fantastic. Now, another question that I, I want to draw from that polio experience uh, to apply it to, to your efforts with these other uh, uh, orphan diseases, if you will. Um, but the what we saw with polio uh, was that there were relatively few cases in the world in 2002. In fact, I think there were more cases in 2014 than in 2002. Uh, and it took the polio eradication community nearly a decade to realize that you couldn't coast across the finish line doing what we had been doing for 20 years wasn't going to eradicate polio. It might contain it, but it wouldn't eradicate it. It wouldn't eradicate it. That's correct. An end game strategy with really triple the budget was implemented about three years ago to, to really eradicate the disease. And even with that effort, we're probably a year or maybe two behind schedule for eradicating polio. It's a huge effort. How do you see your other diseases uh, playing out in terms of that end game strategy? Are you going to have to have that kind of implementation with those diseases as well? Well, certainly, um, as an economist would look at it, the cost per case in the end game goes way up. Um, that, that's just a fact of life. Uh, in the case of polio, it's been exacerbated because of war-torn situations in Afghanistan and Pakistan and um, a few other places. You know, this is, this is a huge challenge to public health workers to be able to get into the field and actually carry out needed vaccinations, to carry out the transfer of types of vaccines being used, et cetera. In our, uh, in our uh, neglected tropical disease programs, the problem is more uh, of how much time and energy goes into the post mass drug treatment phase. So right now, uh, what, what, what happens is that we do mass drug treatment, which means several times a year, we will uh, come into a village, for example, and gather everyone together and treat everyone. Uh, in the case of blinding trachoma, uh, it happens at a very large scale. For example, in Ethiopia in um, end of May, we were uh, holding mass drug events that would treat about 8 million people per week. If you wow. think about the scale of that, how many facilities have to be ready to bring people in? How many community health workers have to have been working with the community to get everybody mobilized, to bring them together, line them up, and bring them through a mass treatment uh, operation. Uh, that's what we do. Um, now, once an area is, is deemed free of disease, there comes a point where you need to stop mass drug treatment and begin uh, post at what's referred to as MDA or mass drug administration, post MDA surveillance. And so the question there, Devin, is just for how, how many years do we do that before we conclude that an area that once was endemic with the disease is now uh, no longer endemic and that the local health authorities, in the case of, say, trachoma, are able to treat cases that arise. In the case of river blindness, it is more a situation of making sure that the parasite really has been eliminated from the geography and that there is no effective means for reintroducing the disease. Um, and, uh, and each disease has its own specific characteristics, but let me give you one example. In the case of river blindness, the disease is spread by a black fly that 
transmits the parasite when it bites you. You know you've been uh, you've got the parasite because pretty soon thereafter you'll start itching. The, the parasite goes into the skin and causes a terrible itching. And that itching is something that these people that have had to live with the disease over many years know very well. And they know very well now when they've had that eliminated that nobody is suffering that itching and that it progresses eventually to blindness. It progresses to the eye and causes blindness. And then it, therefore they've known years and years now uh, after mass drug administration programs where there are no blind people uh, as a result of the disease and people are no longer itching. So in that, that disease's case, if somebody ever started that intense itching, they would know how to report it. They would know they have the channels now to report the disease and affect local community health workers working with the Ministry of Health. And, you know, the, the drug treatment would be reinitiated. So um, th there are different ways that we'll have to go about with our neglected tropical diseases to know that we have, in fact, accomplished our mission, had the impact that we sought to eliminate the diseases uh, completely. Fantastic. Now, Dave, uh, I, I've really taken up a lot of your time, and I appreciate your willingness to, to hang with us a few more minutes, but qu quickly, perhaps, you could just tell us, uh, you are really a role model. My heavens, uh, you know, as the winner of this Hilton Prize, uh, uh, you, you're revered around the world among nonprofit leaders. Uh, there are millions of people on this planet who owe their sight and health to you and the work that you do. Who do you look up to for inspiration? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I, I've had the, uh, personally the, the pleasure and um, professional benefit of working with some inspired, brilliant people. Uh, my predecessors at the task force, Dr. Bill Feggy, Dr. Mark Rosenberg, many of my colleagues there, these are among the world leaders in uh, public health. Uh, I had years at the Johns Hopkins University where I had similar, similarly the, the joy of working with inspired, brilliant people. But actually, to, you know, thinking about the answer to your question, I, it, for me, it would have to be my father. Uh, my dad uh, grew up as an orphan and was uh, kind of casually adopted by multiple different families, managed to work his way out of uh, abject poverty and into the middle class, raise a big family. And in doing so, he taught us important values, like all people matter. Uh, and those examples that I saw when dad would bring home like porters from the trains back in the early 50s, people who would not be encouraged to go to a local restaurant or, or hotel, you'd bring them to our house. All people mattered, and Dad felt uh, no matter what their circumstance, we should, we should give. Um, I remember early as a child, my mother telling the story that when uh, they were a young couple with several little babies, this is right after World War II. They were going down the street and a, a man, a beggar was there and dad gave him his last two dollars and my mother was horrified. She says, well, you've got a wife and kid, two kids to feed. How are you giving us away our last dollars? And he said, well, I, I think I can make it and this poor fellow can't. And he was just confident and, and optimistic that he could make it into the future and he taught me those values that you care for everybody and you look with optimism that you can act and achieve so i have to credit a lot to my father well, that's great what a great story i appreciate you sharing that uh inspiring recollection uh dave you could be doing anything obviously you're a talented guy and perhaps your your father is the reason but Given that you could be doing anything, why are you engaged in uh, global public health? Well, several reasons. Um, one, is it, it feels like the right thing. <laughs> um, doing the work we do is incredibly gratifying. But there's another reason, and, and that is, you know, very personal, and that, that is that as the health of societies improves, 
the economic development of that com com country improves. And as economies improve and people have more at stake in being a part of a robust global economy, that actually brings uh, at least augurs towards peace. Uh, people are less excited to go to war when they have a lot to lose. Um, and I, I, so I think about my children and my granddaughter, and I think about their future, and I think the work we do actually will help bring about a not only healthier world, but a more peaceful world. And uh, it is, for those reasons, I do what I do. I do it at the Task Force for Global Health because of our collaborative model. Uh, I was attracted to that, to the task force, because of the model that Dr. Bill Feggy put in place and the model that Dr. Mark Rosenberg was keeping in place, and that is that we reach out and build broad partnerships to create impact. And I love that model. I thought that I would like to be a part, like to be a part of it. Now that's a great, uh, a great logic for engaging in what you do, and I certainly share your conviction that uh, ultimately these things lead to a more peaceful world. We like to ask all of our guests, Dave, for uh, what we call an impact hack, some tip that would help us to do more good in the world. What's your impact hack? One of the things that I'm really quite uh, insistent on and passionate about is that as an organization, we develop formalized logic models for our work. A logic model is a way of relating the activities one does to the direct outputs of that work. And the outputs of that work then are supposed to bring about some kind of outcomes, therefore lead you to an impact. So to be very explicit about that thread of logic that says, if we do the following things, here's why we believe it will create a, a certain impact. That modeling exercise also forces one to say, and how would we know it when we see it? What would we measure? And can we measure it? Because if you can't do that, then you're really just saying, well, it's a hope and a prayer. We think we'll do some good stuff, and good stuff will happen there, therefore. And we don't believe that. We look very concretely at the kind of activities we will have to do over what period of time. And I think part of the success of the programs at the Task Force for Global Health is that we have been very deliberate about choosing things that we know that we control enough of the controllable variables to lead us to the actual measured impacts that we say we seek. So eliminating these diseases, we knew that with the Merck donation, river blindness could be eliminated if we stayed the course, if we built the partnerships with the ministries of health and other implementing partners and ma managed to hold them together over a long enough period of time, we knew we would have impact. Similarly, with our building field epidemiology capacity or using information with power, every one of those programs is built around knowing the endpoint or what Dr. Bill Feggy used to call the final mile. Same, as you well said with our discussion on polio, the same exists there. We know what the end point will be, and we know scientifically what it's going to take to get there. Well, I think that's a great model, and I appreciate you sharing that. I, I, I'm going to make a point to go back and listen to this a couple of times so that I can uh, implement that in my work, because I think it's uh, – universally applicable, even though I see how it is especially powerful in your work. It, it would be applicable to, to everyone who's trying to do good. So thank you for sharing that great impact hack. Dave, before you go, please tell people how they could learn more about the Task Force for Global Health and how they can connect with you. Sure. Uh, well, I encourage you to check out our website, www.taskforce.org. Uh, you can email us at info at taskforce.org. Uh, we monitor that. Our communication staff uh, monitors it uh, daily, if not hourly. So if anyone wants to reach us or me via email, that would be a very convenient way. Uh, we are available on social media uh, with through the face, Facebook at our full name, The Task Force for Global Health. 
uh, is, uh, is through Facebook and via Twitter at our initials, TFGH, at TFGH uh, on, on Twitter. We monitor all of our social media channels and uh, are eager to hear from people, eager to engage with people. And if anyone's out there who would like to uh, think about being uh, a, a donator to our cause, help us with our new building, whatever, or even just um, sign up to, to help do good work, we'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Well, Dave, thank you very much for being with us today. We really appreciate you taking the time. Devin, thank you so much for having me. We, uh, my colleagues and I really appreciate it. All righty. Let's do some good. <laughs>